internet this morning, which is fantastic. In fact, this is a study in 2010 in the US suggesting that about six out of 10 uh, Americans access the internet for personal health information. A follow-up blog in 2011, now the statistics risen to eight out of 10 Americans accessing the internet. I think Alison earlier also quoted this study, Stats Can, specifically on e-health, uh, on, on internet, uh, and they found that 64 out of 100 a person in Canada access medical information online, personal medical information. So for you and I, when I see my patient in the emergency department, when you see your colleagues or patients or associates in the office, most likely many of them have gone to the internet to find information before they come to me in the emergency department, and many of them more will go home and look up information, whether you want to tell us or not, whether you want to tell us or not. So there's this foundation of information out there. And I think Kathy gave some really wonderful examples in Australia globally about different ways people access the internet. For example, this Mayo Clinic site having self-depression assessment. Also this UK site looking at some of the listing of therapies. Uh, for example, behavioral therapy on self-help. Uh, Living Life of Fall being one of them. And you can just click and find the information. And think about the bar up there. There's a mobile piece. And in fact, there are a lot of individuals who are now access the internet through the mobile devices. And so we talked a little bit about usability early on. So how do you then also design your web strategy so that it actually fit into the mobile devices, fit into the real estate of your mini uh, tablets or your tablets, and other huge area for us to actually consider. So like said, patient like me is more than more than just transactions, more than me going to the website and find information, or me as a clinician putting information online, but really asking people to participate, the crowdsourcing piece. For example, people who have depression, people who have diabetes, they go online and they ask each other, who's on metformin as a medication diabetes, for example? And then people say, oh, for those who are on metformin, could you tell me what side effects you experience? And so people just suggest, oh, this is what I experience, this is how I do this. And through this, they actually get to learn from each other about that peer piece. In fact, I think Michael talked about on social media, about the empowerment, about the crowdsourcing, about the community that we build together. And so, again, tremendous uh, uh, opportunity for that. YouTube and other huge social media uh, activity that people not only access on the uh, internet, but my, my kids, uh, you know, my, my daughter, a teenager, uh, grade 12, wonderful daughter, uh, and uh, we said, you know, 10 o'clock, go to your room. And she's very happy to go to the room because she take her cell phone there. <laughs> she wants to on her cell phone. <laughs> and so uh, uh, Dr. Mike Evans in Toronto, now this is one of his really early video about uh, looking at what can you do in half an hour every day to make a huge difference in your life. 2.9 million people now have watched this video. And then he had a follow-up video in terms of, you know, what is the single most important thing you can do to manage stress. I'm not going to give the story away. I welcome you to watch that particular video. But again, a lot of resources online <coughs> to actually stimulate and engage the public in thinking about using electronic technologies for their own personal health. Uh, so mobile phones, not only access websites, not only thinking about, for example, the real estate that you have. How do you want to make that an effective strategy to engage? But text messaging, again, a huge opportunity for cell phones, uh, mobile phones for usage. Uh, in fact, it, it in some ways very much changed the way, I still remember, six years ago, my sister was in Beijing, and I was supposed to meet her in Hong Kong. And so, right after the day I traveled, I said to my sister, where am I supposed to meet you? And she said, yeah, we'll, we'll, I'll get there. <laughs> and so, the, the minute I land, in fact, she knew my flight, and she texted me, and then said, oh, where are you? And then within about half an hour, we found each other. As opposed to Rose and Lapel, I don't know what it is. <laughs> I'll meet you, watch look for my rules. Text messaging not only brings people together much faster, but now has randomized controlled trials to actually suggest that it helped improve lifestyle management, exercise, and weight control, uh, cessation of smoking or drug use. In fact, randomized controlled trials, especially on complicated medical regimens, for example, HIV medicines. Very clear, randomized controlled trial demonstrated text messaging, helping our patients and the public to use medication appropriately to improve care. And asthma, diabetes, sexually transmitted infections, 
connecting with uh, people and also medical results. So text messaging, another huge opportunity for us to think about how does mobile technology help us to continue to reach this, these individuals and connect with them. Michael talked about social media, so I'm not going to dwell on it. Uh, the fact that there are different uh, social media for us to share information, to build the community, to actually think about how do we connect and share the type of information that we have. In fact, the whole point about tweeting, uh, there are three phases of tweeting. First, you tweet out the information. Second, you retweet the information. <laughs> you start sharing that information. And number three, I'll talk a little bit more, is, is about how do you feel about that information. In fact, you would look for Twitter and the momentum and dynamic of those three phases. In fact, if you get to the second phase of tweeting, and you get to the third phase of sharing emotions, you know your tweets has got to the individuals that you need to go. And so, um, we talked about using the mobile phone to access web, we talked about text messaging, we talked about social media to go on mobile. In fact, a lot of people, maybe some of you are already tweeting this particular conference out. Uh, and in fact, many conferences are now doing tweeting uh, right live on, on the internet at the same time. Apps is another very important area of measuring your bio sensors. So just share with you some of the general developments in this area you may be already aware. This is three years old, this technology. So you actually snap a uh, electro onto the back of your, of your smartphone, put it on your chest, and you can now detect your live rhythm. And in fact, it's more than just live rhythm. It actually do a one lead ECG. So you can tell whether a person could be having a heart attack or not. This is three years old. And in fact, if you hold it on your right hand, put it in your leg, for those of you who are interested in cardiology, you get E2. If you switch hands and go to the switch legs, you get E3. So you have the ability to start thinking about this as an implication of being able to help monitor patients. And in fact, uh, uh, one of the speakers who actually used this on the plane actually diagnosed atrial fibrillation on the person on the plane because he was saying, oh, I feel a little bit dizzy and weak. Um, ultrasound probe connect to uh, iPhone. Uh, in fact, two years old now, this technology. In Redmond, uh, I think, uh, Jill, you may want to look into that. In, in Redmond. I know this. Oh, you know this guy. Oh, wow, fantastic. You know, the, the thing is, you know, you can plug in uh, an ultrasound probe and then you can uh, use your iPhone to send that information anywhere, anywhere you want. In fact, it's very interesting. A YouTube video saying that the mother can do her own ultrasound at home, that particular photo. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, tomorrow, I mean today, we have people coming to our hospital, coming to our merchant department, coming to your clinic, saying that yeah, I've done 50 pages of research on this illness. What do you think about this information? Very near future, tomorrow, we will have for, for example, a mother coming in and said, I'm five months pregnant. Uh, I've gained this many pounds, and when I do an ultrasound on my baby, the head circumference is less one centimeter less than average. What does this mean? <laughs> <laughs> Different worlds. Especially when individuals are using the cell phones, especially <coughs> detecting with their bowel sensors, sensing their particular body functions, we are looking at different generations of information. Uh, this one, Natura Foundation. Uh, actually developed that eyepiece by slipping that eyepiece onto the camera and you look into it, it actually takes a picture of your retina. And you can now send that retina screen to any ophthalmologist to say, do I have this eye disease in diabetes, do I have these type problems? So again, you can go anywhere with this. And in fact, the power of this. This one really is really interesting. Uh, this is a Northwest University professor, very interested in biathlons, triathlons, but she's very interested in trying to monitor her own status and say, well, what's my fluid status over time? And so what she did was she developed nanotechnology, microtubules that you can uh, put in two dots under skin. It's like a small tattoo. Mm -hmm. And then that tattoo has microtubules so that when you shine uh, infrared lights of a mobile device over it, it will tell you in real time what your serum sodium and serum glucose is in real time. Don't poke you. In fact, now there are interventions where it actually tape on your chest and through Bluetooth connect to your phones. This is the way that actually, these are just a scratch in the surface of the types of apps, of the types of our sensing that are happening. 